Hello there, and welcome back to Construction Grammar and its application to English. In this video, I will talk about language change and how language change can be studied in a constructional perspective. Okay? So, um, right. I would like you to think about language change in terms of language variation across time. In the last video, I talked about language variation and how the choice that speakers have between sets of constructions uh, is governed by language internal factors, language external factors that explain how speakers decide in a given situation. Now, it's the same kind of thinking that we apply to language change, namely variation over time. Diachronic shifts in variation is what we see in language change. Let me give you an example. So, speakers of present-day English, they know the semantic spectrum of the S genitive construction. There's variation at the meaning pole of the S genitive construction so that you can express ideas like possession, John's book, spatial contiguity, John's hometown, or temporal contiguity, yesterday's events. As a present day speaker of English, you know which of these meanings are more central and which of these meanings are more peripheral. The question is, however, did speakers of earlier generations have that same knowledge of the S genitive? And the likely answer to that is no, they don't, because the S genitive construction has changed over time. Okay, a tricky question, of course, is how can we study how linguistic knowledge differs between generations of speakers? When we're talking about long-term historical comparisons, well, the generations that we're interested in, unfortunately, they're already dead. So we cannot bring them into the lab and ask them questions or have them do psycholinguistic experiments. So what do we do? Well, there are two main approaches here. Um, Real-time studies and apparent time studies. Real-time studies are usually uh, based on historical corpus data so that you have a corpus representing language use from the 17th century, the 18th century, the 19th and the 20th century. And then you retrieve, say, examples of the S genitive and you check how your data from one period differs from data from the other period. Right. <clears throat> um, here I brought you three little examples from the corpus of historical American English, which represents uh, two centuries worth of data from the 1810s to the 2000s. And um, for instance here with this relative pronoun whom, yeah, you recognize that as a slightly old-fashioned stuffy kind of construction and sure enough it goes down in text frequency. These days hardly anybody uses this. Mm, conversely in the middle I have a word formation process Combine the noun and the participle related, as in drug-related, work-related, age-related, and so on and so forth. And you see that this seems to be a recent success story. So, to a present-day speaker, this n-related construction, quite productive. Um, to speakers of earlier generations, not so much, okay? And then, uh, at the bottom of the slide, I searched for a subset of ditransitives, yeah? A verb followed by a pronoun followed by an indefinite noun phrase. Give me a chance, tell you a story, tell you a secret, that kind of thing. And you notice that um, in terms of frequency, there's not much of a change. But that doesn't mean that uh, this construction hasn't changed, okay? There could be changes in there, in the data, that simply don't express themselves in rising or falling text frequency. But there could very well be changes that pertain to the selection process between ditransitive and prepositional dative that have changed without the frequency uh, changing that much. Okay, real-time studies. Those contrast with apparent time studies in which you take data from a single historical period, the present usually, yeah, uh, and you compare the speech of speakers that come from different age brackets or different generations. So you compare how, um, well, speakers between 60 and 80 um, pronounce a certain vowel or how they introduce a quotation 
something like that. Um, compare that to 40 to 60 year olds, to 20 to 40 year olds, to uh, really young people that are younger than 20. And uh, if you can find a phenomenon that, that changes across these four groups, then you can extrapolate that to say, okay, here we have a change in progress um, where, say, the older people are using an element like whom more frequently, and then it goes down linearly across the four uh, groups. So there you have language change <clears throat> in a snapshot of present-day data. Okay, now how do you approach an issue such as language change from a constructional perspective? <clears throat> um, okay, diachronic construction grammar, that to my mind is the study of constructional variation over time and the aim of course is still the classic construction grammar aim we want to figure out what does a speaker know when they know a language and the diachronic twist here is we want to figure out how the linguistic knowledge of present-day speakers differs from the knowledge that generations past have had okay now the challenge in here lies in the variation okay so this connects to the last video on linguistic variation constructions namely can change with regard to form meaning but also with regard to things like text frequency type frequency and spread through the community through different genres right um okay i have to confess i have dabbled in this topic, constructional change, yeah, um, and I have proposed a definition of constructional change. It's not the only one out there, but it's one that I find useful. Um, so constructional change is what happens to a construction, okay? It selectively seizes a construction, a conventionalized form-meaning pair, and then something happens to it, yeah? Uh, and this something can take several shapes. It can either be an alteration in terms of the construction's form, but it's also the function, the meaning, that can change. Um, any aspect of its frequency can change. Text frequency, type frequency, relative frequency of different variants, yeah? um, but also its dis distribution in the linguistic community can change, so that something that only young people used to say spreads through uh, the entire population. Yeah. This is complicated stuff because all of these changes may happen in interaction with each other. <clears throat> Let me walk you through a couple of change types. Yeah. Uh, a simple uh, change would be change in form as we see it for instance in phonological reduction. Classic example of uh, be going to reduced to I'm gonna or even further reduced to I'm a. Mm -hmm. um, discourse markers also they uh, tend to phonologically reduce so a matrix uh, complement taking verb like I mean uh, tends to get reduced to something like I mean I mean yeah when people use that as a filler when they uh, have processing difficulties or want to introduce something that's a little bit more complicated. Um, yeah. Or uh, John Bybee has written on, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Phonological reduction. Um, changes in form can also pertain to the syntax of a construction, so that, for instance, a part of a construction that used to be optional can become obligatory, yeah, obligatorification. Um, an interesting example of this is uh, seen in the way construction. Michael Israel has studied the way construction on the basis of the Oxford English Dictionary, and uh, something interesting that he found was that um, over the time in which the way construction developed, the final um, yeah, path or goal constituent um, underwent obligatorification. So in early data you have examples such as the legions speed their headlong way and a modern speaker would go okay they sped their headlong way where exactly? 
um, to a modern speaker, there needs to be something like out of prison or through the marshes or something like that. Okay, change in form. Um, there are other changes in form. Um, there's one phenomenon in uh, grammaticalization that goes by the name of host class expansion. Okay, it's a corollary of grammaticalization and it means that a construction that used to be restricted to a certain syntactic shape expands um, the classes that can the syntactic classes that it can occur in that very slot. So uh, there's an example of uh, it clefts here. Amanda Patton has studied it clefts and uh, she has shown nicely that it clefts have expanded the kinds of focus phrases uh, that they can take. So in the first example we have a nominal focus phrase, it was the butler that killed her. Then we have a prepositional phrase, it was in December that she was coming. Uh, adverbials, it's here that we met or in clauses, it's vacuuming the floor that I hate most. Yeah. So in present-day English there's variation, but this variation is sort of naturally grown. Uh, it used to be just the noun phrases and it expanded from there. The host class of uh, it cleft focus phrases expanded. Also that change in form. Coming to changes in meaning. <clears throat> um, yeah. What are changes in meaning uh, in grammatical constructions? For instance, we can have something like a manner adverbial morphing into a sentence adverbial and maybe later even into a discourse marker. Um, think of hopefully, for instance. Um, so hopefully in the sense that the prescriptivist tradition always likes to promote, full of hope. Yeah? That would be something like, hopefully he opened his mailbox. In a state full of hope, he opened his mailbox. Um, notice, notice that this doesn't work with, hopefully he doesn't have his phone switched off. Yeah? It's not him full of hope having the phone switched off. Adverbials are known to do this. Yeah? Mm. Actually, it's a quite similar process. He actually handed in his thesis last week, so actually, in fact. And this correspond, this uh, contrasts in some sense uh, with, uh, actually, he handed in his thesis last week. Yeah. I'll leave it to you to figure out the exact uh, semantic pragmatic difference there. <clears throat> okay, I mentioned grammaticalization already twice or so in this video. Um, the hallmark of grammaticalization is the change of lexical meaning into grammatical meaning such as the movement sense of be going somewhere to the future meaning of be going to or the perception meaning in seeing as in the into the causal meaning of seeing as uh, an example such as um, seeing as you're his only relative you really should go and visit him uh, in the hospital right um, Grammaticalization is not just the change of lexical stuff into grammatical stuff. There's also something called secondary grammaticalization, so grammatical stuff turning even more grammatical. For instance, uh, the connector since in its temporal meaning developing into since in a causal meaning. Yeah. Okay, coming to changes in frequency. This is not just a uh, change in text frequency, although that's perhaps the first thing that we might think of. Yeah? Um, there are declines in text frequency. Think of the example of whom. Um, quite often we see increases in text frequency. Um, there is a pragmatic marker that is a recent success story, namely that said. Yeah? Uh, so I, I really like your paper, that said. There are some serious problems. Um, so that's a marker that sort of indicates a shift in uh, evaluative stance. Type frequency is important. Uh, so for instance, with the modal auxiliary shell, there has been a steady decline in type frequency in the recent uh, decades and centuries. <clears throat> shall used to occur across the board with lots and lots of verbs that has decreased 
Uh, so these days only a select few verbs regularly occur with shall. But we also see increases in type frequency, for instance with this uh, noun-related construction, work-related, drug-related, accident-related. Okay, um, there are further changes in frequency, um, such as change in the relative frequency of constructional variance, yeah? both at the formal pole and at the meaning pole. So, for instance, um, I'll uh, discuss this in more detail in a little while, but S genitives with inanimate possessors, like yesterday's events, they have become more frequent over time. So earlier generations weren't so much saying things like yesterday's events. Ditransitives with inanimate recipients, as in let's give the turkey five more minutes. Also that, you know, ditransitive, it used to be more strongly restricted to animate recipients. And then, um, well, this it cleft study I mentioned just a few minutes ago, it clefts with in-clause focus phrases. It's washing this, his hair that he can't stand. Also, that is a recent thing. The free, relative frequency of in-clauses within uh, the sum total of it clefts has increased. So here, changes in the relative frequency of constructional variance. That is part of what you know when you know a construction. How frequent is a certain constructional variant? <clears throat> a last change in frequency that I want to discuss here uh, concerns the social distribution of a construction. Okay, who in the population of speakers says something? Also that is part of your linguistic knowledge. Um, it's fascinating stuff. Um, so <clears throat> I was like, what's that all about? That's something that sounds young, yeah? Like, something that a young speaker would say. And uh, indeed, uh, people who have studied this empirically have found that it's a construction that has been advanced by young female speakers, but then picked up by young males and by older speakers as well. A second um, age-graded uh, construction that I wanted to mention is uh, dude. Yeah, dude. I was wearing these shoes before it was cool. I don't know. Um, when do people still wear converses? I don't know. Um, okay, so dude is an interesting topic because uh, this construction is mostly used in same gender speech of young males. Okay, so it's a it's a buddy kind of thing, but it's spreading to other groups. And interestingly, to the extent that females use it, they also tend to use it in same gender speech. It's it's so cool. Okay, dude. <clears throat> now. What's complicated about constructional change is that typically everything happens all at once. So constructional change alters multiple aspects of a construction at the same time. And this makes it very, very complicated to tease apart what happens when, why, and um, during what time window. Okay, I brought two case studies to illustrate constructional change. One shamelessly, my own, um, I looked at possessive determiners, things like uh, with mine own eyes or the days of my life, yeah? And I looked at um, examples from the history of English, and here these are two manuscripts. Of course, I looked at, you know, not at the manuscripts like that, but um, computerized corpus data. <clears throat> Nonetheless, what you can see on the slide is that say some people are using both forms yeah, with the nasal without the nasal but with a certain preference <clears throat> other writers are more even-handed in their use okay um, but this can make you think well why do they use both why are they inconsistent so to speak and <clears throat> are there perhaps any explanation for why they choose one over the other? And of course, there's not just one explanation. There are several explanations that have been proposed. Trivially, perhaps, time plays a role. Yeah? Later texts are more likely to contain the modern endless variant. These days, nobody says with mine own eyes. Um, the phonological context 
has been said to play a role. So my life with the following uh, consonant, there the endless variant is favored. Stress has been said to play a role. So when the pronoun is stressed, as in not my idea, that wasn't my idea. Also, the endless variant is favored. Gender, here we have the classic uh, sociolinguistic effect that women are more progressive users of language. So in the historical record, women favor the endless variant before their male peel peers uh, do that. But there are also factors that um, have a conservative effect. So formality, formal genres have been said to um, retain the formal older variant longer. And also collocations. Yeah. So that in frequent chunks like mine own, the old variant is conserved longer. Why is that? Well, um, if a chunk such as mine own becomes entrenched in the mind because you say it so often, then you become more reluctant to make the switch to the new variant, even if in other contexts you already say, my old friend, you, mine own that still runs nicely off the tongue. Okay, so these are factors that have been proposed, uh, and I decided to have a look whether uh, I could substantiate this on the basis of corpus data. So I looked at examples from the uh, corpus of early English correspondence, giving me data from the 1200s to the 1700s. And here you see it's a nice S curve that goes through the data points. Of course, there's much more data in the second half of it, but nonetheless, nice enough. Some almost 20,000 examples. And um, well, on the following slides, you see the same data, but um, with regard to the factors that have been proposed. So here's a slide on the phonological context, and you see that indeed phonological context seems to play a role. So in pre-consonantal environments, my life, the curve goes up much more quickly than uh, in pre-H environments and pre-vocalic environments. Yeah, reassuringly enough, pre-vocalic, they are the latest, and pre-H are somewhat in the middle, but closer to the pre-vocalic than to the pre-consonantal. With H's, you can never be quite sure. Did people pronounce that? Did people not pronounce that? So, makes sense to have them in the middle. Um, here's another slide looking at the factor of gender, and a problem in historical data, of course, is that quite often you don't know the gender. Yeah, the text could have been written by anyone, or maybe there's a woman's name uh, on it, but there was a scribe, uh, and the, the letter or what have you was was dictated to the scribe, and the scribe did a little bit of editing, and you know the scribe probably was male, and so yeah, complicated. But again, a nice thing is that uh, insofar as we have the data, it looks as though that women are actually in the lead in the last three periods. Yeah, so they're the more progressive users of language. Men are the most conservative. And the unknown um, language users are somewhere in the middle. OK. <clears throat> um, here's a graph that shows you the different time periods with regard to the factor of formality. And it looks as though that there is no real effect of formality. So sometimes the informal texts show a higher ratio of the modern variant, and sometimes the formal texts show a greater uh, ratio of the uh, new variant. Hard to say whether there's anything here, but it doesn't look like it. Okay, the question that I was interested in was which factors make a difference? Yeah. All of them had been proposed, but do they really make a difference if we account for them at the same time? And uh, secondly, at what time do they make a difference? It could be that there is a time window during which gender really plays a strong role, but then uh, the men catch up yeah, and gender no longer plays a role. The data, the corpus data, actually allow us to build a computational model of the changes that took place and to check 
which factor has made a difference at what time. <clears throat> so, um, you remember from last time the general reasoning of a variationist uh, study. You have an alternation, like the days of my life or mine life, yeah, and uh, you get the analysis to ignore whether the n-less variant is used or the n-full variant is used, yeah, but you want to predict when, whether one or the other is used on the basis of a number of language internal and language external factors. So, can we predict which form was chosen based on the fact that the text was written in 1564. Um, so relatively late, maybe it's the modern variant. Uh, the next word starts with a consonant. That's an indicator of the modern variant. Yeah, So two votes in favor of the new one. The writer is male, so uh, maybe the writer is cons conservative. Mm, maybe it's the old variant. The text is from an informal genre, so Okay, maybe it's really the, the modern variant, and so on and so forth. Okay, so for each data point, for each example that we actually have in the corpus, the model produces an educated guess. Um, and on the basis of those guesses, we can see whether the factors allow us to reliably predict uh, which form is used. Now, in this case, um, the model guesses right about 96% of the time, which is a great result. Um, which factors play a role? Time, obviously, but also the following segment, the stress environment, uh, priming, I talked about priming last time, gender, the frequency of collocating uh, words, so all of them in the right predicted uh, direction. Uh, but there were also factors that came out as not significant, namely formality, we kind of guessed that from the graph, and, importantly, the difference between first and second person. So I look both at mine and my, and also at thine and thy. And mine and my, thine and thy, they behave in a way that in the development is really in lockstep. They don't follow separate developmental paths, they do the same thing, um, both first and second person. Okay, um, the second question that I was interested in, of course, is how does the impact of these factors change over time? Yeah, that's in a way the more important question. And there we can see things like the effect of stress. It's really important early on, but then it weakens over time. Um, the effect of a following consonant, my life, yeah, that's really important in the first couple of periods. But in the end, it, um, it flattens out. Yeah, it's uh, no longer important. So um, let me show you this graph here. It's uh, a bit overwhelming, but nonetheless. Um, OK, this graph shows you for every data point in the database a guess with respect to how sure the model is that this is either an n variant or an endless variant. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, on the y-axis, you see it's labeled probability of the endless variant. That is the guess that the model makes. And if the model places a dot high up on the graph, close to one, that means it says, I'm fairly, fairly sure that this is an endless variant. And if the model places a dot fairly down below, uh, close to zero on the graph. It means I'm fairly sure that this is the old variant. Okay, uh, you see I split the data into gray data points and um, yeah, black empty circles. I'm not sure that you can really see that on the screen, but suffice it to say that <clears throat> the gray stuff on the left side, those are the n variants, yeah, the old variant, and the circles those are the endless examples. And so ideally, a perfect model would place all the black circles in the upper half of the graph and all the gray data points in the lower part of the graph. And you see that most data points here are within the green boxes. So the 
modern variants are placed high on the graph, the old variants are placed fairly down below on the graph. But of course there are some interesting uh, misplacements and uh, those are here in the red boxes. Um, so for instance if we look at the one, two, three, in the fourth period in the upper half of the graph you see that there's a cloud of, of gray spots that don't belong there. Yeah. So here the model makes an honest mistake. It, um, I looked at those examples. Those examples have a following consonant and the model of course knows that a following consonant is a sure sign that okay, this really should be the modern variant that is used. It's not. There you have it. Okay. Right. Um, let me come to a second case study, um, and that will be the dative alternation again. The date, you know, no video without the dative alternation. Um, Christoph Volk and colleagues did a, a case study on the diachrony of the dative alternation. Um, so for the last time, enjoy it. Um, you know the contrast. I wrote my sister a letter, the detransitive. I wrote a letter to my sister, the prepositional dative. Um, in the last video, I explained that in present-day English, speakers' choices are determined, for instance, by givenness of theme, of theme and recipient, pronominality of theme and recipient, syntactic length, weight of uh, theme and recipient, the animacy of theme and recipient, the semantic type of transfer, if we're looking at a literal transfer or a metaphorical transfer, structural priming, which variant had been used before, and a couple of others. Yeah? Those are the usual suspects that explain speaker's choices between these two constructions. You know that. Right. Um, in the last video, I also showed that the relative strengths of these factors can vary moderately across different varieties of English. Across, we, we, we saw the case study across uh, American and New Zealand English. The explaining factors ah, have slightly different strengths. And um, this being the case, it's only reasonable to ask, okay, how, how does this vary across time? Um, if New Zealanders and Americans these days are a little different in how they make their choices, it's only likely that uh, people of generations past in Britain and America also differed from how Brits and Americans these days use the, the transitive and prepositional dative. So, again, the logic here, uh, we have an example such as from a diary, uh, M's birth, the, the writer uh, writes M's birthday, wrote, and then either M a loving note or a loving note to M. And again, the model doesn't see these two variants. It has to guess the form that is used on the basis of factors such as the text being written in 1887, the recipient being animate, definite, non-pronominal and just one word long, yeah, M, could be Martin, maybe not. Um, the theme is inanimate, indefinite, non-pronominal non and three words long, a loving note. I have received loving notes. Um, and the text is from British English. Okay. They have more predictors, but that's the logic. And as in uh, the case study that I had just a minute ago, for each data point, the model produces an educated guess. Okay, so the clue here is that you can use the date of alternation and historical data of the date of alternation to research the knowledge of generations past. So it's very well researched how present day speakers process and produce the transitive construction and the prepositional date of construction. It's kind of like the fruit fly in biology. That's the date of alternation for linguistics. Yeah. Um, so we know that analyses based on corpus data correspond very, very well to the behavior of speakers in psycholinguistic experiments. Um, and I encourage you to you know, go to uh, Joan Bresnan's webpage and look at her papers uh, experimenting with the date of alternation, stuff like that. It's uh, 
do yourself the favor, read it. Um, so this means that we can use historical corpora to model the linguistic knowledge of generations past. And that is a cool thing. So um, I showed you some frequencies of the ditransitive in the beginning of this video. Here's the frequency development of the ditransitive uh, called double object here and the prepositional dative across um, two and a half centuries from the 1700s to the 1950s and you see that actually both the prepositional dative that's the lowest line here and the ditransitive that is the one in the middle they both go down so it's not that one increases at the expense of the other rather both go down <clears throat> Um, so the top line there, that's the two constructions combined in their text frequency. <clears throat> Instead of the graph with, uh, with the dots, yeah, uh, I show you here the table that uh, Volk and colleagues publish in their, in their paper. And let me walk you through these results. Um, so <clears throat> these are the coefficients of their regression model. And what it shows is that uh, when we have an animate theme, yeah, uh, that leads speakers to choose the prepositional dative. Yeah. So inanimate theme, uh, you'd be biased towards the, the transitive. An animate theme, like bring the prisoner to the king, yeah, an animate theme, there you would choose the prepositional dative. Um, if the recipient is inanimate, bring a mm, glass of water to the table, prepositional dative. Yeah, same thing in present day English. If we have an indefinite recipient, um, so <clears throat> if you gave a distant relative uh, $5, <laughs> that's a silly example. Um, people are biased towards the prepositional dative. Uh, an indefinite theme, yeah, you're biased to the ditransitive. Uh, and uh, when you have a long theme, uh, a tender loving note with scented paper, yeah, uh, you choose the ditransitive. Um, why am I showing you this? Well, this data, which averages over uh, historical time periods, shows essentially that the same factors that govern the behavior of present-day speakers are representative of the entire time period. That in a way is reassuring, but it's not yet the interesting thing. The interesting thing is down here, namely that uh, a factor, the animacy of the recipient, uh, interacts with the factor of time. Yeah? So that a factor is not the same across the different periods of time that Volk and colleagues have analyzed. And uh, what this shows, this effect, is that inanimate recipients are more likely in the ditransitive in the 20th century. Yeah? Give the turkey five more minutes. That is more likely in the 20th century. And that means that your, con uh, your constructional knowledge of the ditransitive differs ever so subtly from the knowledge that people in generations past have had, okay? It overlaps to a large extent, but then there are small things that have happened that have altered the construction so that your constructional knowledge is a little different. Okay, summing up here, um, the linguistic knowledge of present-day speakers differs from the knowledge of earlier generations. In a way, that's trivial too, right? Uh, we know that speakers of Middle English, they knew different stuff from what it is that we know. However, spelling that out in detail, how knowledge differs, that's the task of diachronic construction grammar. Yeah? So, a constructional generalization may change with regard to its form, its function, or any aspect of its frequency. And uh, these changes are registered as usage 
of a construction changes. Yeah? So constructional change is usage-based. Every new instance of a construction token that you hear leaves a little imprint on your constructional knowledge. And you can imagine if this happens over the span of your lifetime, that means that your knowledge of construction is in a steady flux. Yeah, it stays pretty remarkably stable, not only across your own lifetime, but even across generations of time. But it is uh, subject to change. That's the take-home message. Right, this is the last video, so I take the liberty of saying a few words about construction grammar, the big picture. I started with this question, what do speakers know when they know a language? And I gave the answer, uh, well, they know constructions. <laughs> that seems trivial, but really it's not. And I hope that you by now have an impression of what it means to say that speakers know constructions. They know form meaning pairings. Constructions are everything from monomorphemic words to complex syntactic patterns information structure constructions, argument structure constructions. And in these last two videos, we opened up the perspective to include variation. So knowledge of language includes knowledge of constructional variation. Variation both at the formal pole and at the meaning pole. If we say that speakers know constructions, we're also saying that they know how these constructions are interconnected in a large network, the constructicon. We're saying that these constructions are interlinked through instantiation links, subpart links, polysemy links, metaphor links. <clears throat> so, the bottom line is, if we say that knowledge of language is only knowledge of constructions, that's not a trivialization of language. Rather, you know, it's the contrary. Um, the constructional view is a theory that generates hypotheses that make predictions and that can be tested. And uh, it's a hallmark of a good theory that it makes predictions that can be wrong. Yeah? If a theory can't even be wrong, that's terrible. So in all likelihood, some aspects of construction grammar will be shown to be wrong. Okay, you've watched all of these videos, or maybe some of them, or maybe just this one. Um, but if you watched all of them, then you, you know everything I know about construction grammar. You have a rough idea of construction grammar as a linguistic theory. And um, you will notice, if you engage further with the literature, that what has been presented here is only one particular flavor of construction grammar, sometimes called cognitive construction grammar, the style of work that Adele Goldberg pursues. There are several branches of construction grammar, several flavors, and uh, I only list five here. Um, so there's also cognitive grammar, the work of Ron Lanneker, uh, radical construction grammar um, with a more typological approach, uh, Bill Croft's work, sign-based construction grammar, um, there's a recent book by Hans Boas and the late Ivan Sark, um, highly recommended. Um, and of course, there's super interesting work going on in fluid construction grammar, uh, Luke Steele's group, so Google fluid construction grammar. Yeah, right. There's all of this stuff going on and uh, you should go and explore it. Yeah, you should find your own way. Um, here's another interesting source. Um, namely Thomas Hoffmann and Graham Trousdale's Oxford Handbook of Construction Grammar. I, I have it here. Um, yeah, lots of stuff in there. And um, other than that, all that's left for me to tell you is that construction grammar is a framework that's very much under construction. If you decide you want to work on it, it's a perfect time because there's lots of stuff left to be done. And with that, I think I'll leave you.